Hello, and welcome to Quality of Life, the program where we look at different influences that can affect one's well-being as well as ultimately their quality of life. In this episode, we're going to take a look at drug use and how it can affect one's quality of life. Joining us today from the Sheboygan Police Department is Police Chief Chris Domogolski. Hi, Dave. Hello, welcome. And Captain Jim Wieser, who's Captain of the Criminal In Investigative Division, or CID. Welcome, Jim. First of all, I'd like to thank both of you for taking times out of your schedule. I know you guys are really busy and being on the show to help talk about this subject, as well as um, giving us a good educational thing about drug use. So, Appreciate the opportunity. You bet. So um, I guess I'd like to start out with is what are the types of drugs in our community you know, that you're seeing or that's most popular? I think there's obviously a variety of drugs. Um, legal drugs and illegal drugs. So illegal drugs, we're talking about marijuana, um, cocaine, heroin, maybe a little bit uh, of methamphetamine, and then legal drugs, which are, are also a very serious problem in the community. And in there, we're talking about the abuse of alcohol and the abuse of prescription drugs. And I think it's important that we point out that probably the abuse of those legal drugs uh, it's probably a greater factor that has a detrimental effect on the community than even the, uh, the illegal drugs that are more commonly talked about. Is prescription drugs fairly new to the list or has that always been around? I think to, to, to a large degree it's probably um, always been around but over the last probably in the last five years we've seen a much greater abuse uh, of the prescription drugs. Okay. And I, I guess I can add something to that is, is that mention of prescription drugs mm -hmm. um, due to the fact of that uh, um, new formula for that is that you've seen people turn to heroin because of that uh, unavailability of that mm -hmm. same uh, addictive quality. Because I know when the times I was, you know, prescribed uh, something for pain, you know, codone or whatever, Vicodin, it's like, holy cow, you get a really easy or a fast buzz on it. It's like, wow, it puts, knocks me off my feet. So, Yeah, very um, potent high yeah. potency and also highly addictive. And that's why they're controlled mm -hmm. at the level that they are is because of that um, potential to be uh, addicted to it. Okay. What would you say is the number one drug appearance in our community that you have issues with? I would say quite clear it. Clearly, it's still alcohol, and that we have a, a culture of uh, alcohol abuse both mm -hmm. in, in Sheboygan, Sheboygan County, and the state of Wisconsin as a whole. So that's probably the biggest issue that I see is, is confronting that culture and trying to, mm -hmm. to change that to cut down on the abuse of alcohol. Mm -hmm. but that's a whole subject in itself, so as far as that goes. Um, where would you say... Uh, the drug traffic, or how do the drugs get into our community? I guess uh, there's a number of ways in regards to that. Number one is is that someone that has easy access to a supply, or supply or source cities, as they say they are, are typically Rockford or Chicago, Illinois. And what happens is, is a person that um, is partaking in dealing those narcotics typically then moves to our community and then makes contact with people they know or starts to find new clients. Um, the other way that people obtain drugs in our community is, is that um, a number of drug users, um, they get together, they pool their money, and someone drives to either Milwaukee or Chicago to obtain those drugs and then returns them to the community to uh, then provide them. Um, you had mentioned prescription uh, drugs, and I guess, you know, that one is one where someone within the community um, is using prescription drugs legally but then someone else might take those drugs and then mm -hmm. distribute them illegally. So that would be another way that those drugs are uh, gaining access to our community. Sure. Uh, and I would just follow up a little bit on what Jim said about um, distribution of, of some of the illegal drugs mm -hmm. is really done along the same model that, that any product would be distributed by a business. So um, depending on what the source of those drugs are, marijuana, um, typically e either Mexico, South America, or more recently high-grade marijuana from Canada would be distributed um, to source cities similar to any business, how they would try to mm -hmm. um, source out their product and then move it through a retail chain. 
So very similar like that, same thing with, with cocaine that's coming in would go to major cities like Chicago and be distributed mm -hmm. there. One of the things that we've seen over the last five years, I would say, is because law enforcement has gotten better at working together through some of um, uh, multi-jurisdictional task forces mm -hmm. such as the Sheboygan County Mag Unit or on a larger scale, the HIDAs that the federal government um, have set up. So uh, HIDA stands for High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area. Mm -hmm. It's a federal initiative um, tied together with enforcement and then other community assets to try to build up the community. So Chicago has a HIDA, Milwaukee has a HIDA that's um, tied together with a bunch of cities in Milwaukee with both federal and local partners. So bringing all that information together um, allows them to target better on some of the, the major dealers. Mm -hmm. And one of the effects of, of those HIDAs and the, and the greater um, cooperation and partnerships that have developed is that there's a lot of pressure in the major cities on the, the major drug dealers. And be, because of that coordination, one of the things that it's done is um, push some of those um, drugs that are being distributed out of those major cities. So rather than finding it in Chicago, you might find it in the suburb of Chicago and rather than finding it in the city of Milwaukee, they might find some other place that they have connections mm -hmm. and, and Sheboygan might be one of those areas. And so we've seen that Sheboygan can be um, a source city, has been identified mm -hmm. as a source city in the past for cocaine. Um, and recently in the last two or three years um, for marijuana coming from um, the, the West Coast and um, through Minneapolis down to Sheboygan. And recently we've seen that um, Sheboygan's been a, a source city for heroin to go to Manitowoc and Ozaki and some of these other surrounding counties around us. Wow, it really opens your eyes, you know, if you don't know about it or, you know, you hear about it, it's like, no, that can't be. You know, it's really surprising. Um, in my <laughs> Citizens Academy, when I um, attended that one, I know one of them was the presentation that you guys put on with you know the whole drug use and the different um, techniques or the different types of drugs that are out there it was a great presentation. And how do you guys keep up to date or on top of the thing? Because one of the things that came out of the presentation is when you do, you know, arrest somebody for drug abuse, they go to jail. It's like going to school and getting better when they come out. You know, how do you guys stay on top of that? Well, I guess you know one of the things that you see is. First of all, the chief had mentioned some agencies is that they, our officers attend training to pay attention to trends and other things that, you know, in regards to delivery of a controlled substance. And, the other, and one of the other ways that we learn how to stay on top of things is we talk to the people that are involved in these things. They provide information on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then we're prepared for something new, a new tactic that someone might use or other types of means of you know, distributing uh, narcotics in our community. So there's a lot of information gained when you talk to people that are involved in it, mm -hmm. whether they be in jail or not. Right. Which brings us to the next point is, uh, if I'm a citizen and I see illegal activity going on, either in exchange or let's say random people coming and going from a house that don't belong there, what should I do as a citizen? Should I, you know, go in as Batman and say, hey, I'm gonna stop this or report it or what should I do? No, I guess in, in regards to that is that, you know, that's a, that's a common question that we do receive. And there's a number of citizens within the community that are willing to provide that information. And there, you can look at that two ways. Some citizens will wish to remain anonymous. So the sure. thing is, is that if you do see some suspicious activity and you feel it warrants a call to the police department because you feel it might be drug activity mm -hmm. or other criminal activity, then they should do that. Now they have the right, or they have every, uh, they don't have to leave their name. They can be anonymous. But on the other hand, it's nice to have a named citizen because then that, you know, lends some cred credibility to the call. It ha it's a contact person for us to see if that activity is continuing. Um, in regards to anonymous information, we have crime stoppers within our community. We, it is a very, it's very beneficial to our police department and other law enforcement agencies in the county. Um, there is good information that's provided and it's anonymous. And in case of Crime Stoppers, if something is uh, found to be substantiated, is that you can get a, a reward for mm -hmm. that. I guess then, then finally, if I was a person within a, a neighborhood um, and I wanted to gain or provide some information to the police, I would, on top of you know, placing that call, I would gain a, a lot of information prior to that. I would pay attention to the residents. 
um, maybe writing down license plates, descriptions of people that enter and exit that residence, uh, and also uh, just the time of day that this activity seems to pick up. Now that information can be provided to a neighborhood officer who can then act, uh, act mm -hmm. on that. But uh, in regards to the, I think you mentioned Superman, yeah. uh, I, I don't uh, want people to do that because you know the thing is is that I understand the logic behind that you want to do something to help your community but it's also can be very dangerous so calling the police or providing the information is the best first alternative I believe okay thank you to, fo to follow up on that a little bit I say that I think Jim hit a, a lot of the the major points really well and that's um, be the eyes and ears for the police and and really try to gather mm -hmm. that information and find out when the activity is happening to really try to narrow it down for us to be successful, that's gonna be one of the keys. We have limited resources, and so it helps if we can sure. um, target those resources to the best times to try to uh, interdict or interrupt what, whatever is happening. The other thing that I would just mention a, a little bit is really the setting expectations is, is kind of what I would call it. So um, if somebody's gonna be dealing drugs in a neighborhood, they're, they're really, again, going back to the business model that we talked about, they're really looking for a good place that they're gonna be able to operate mm -hmm. their business. And so again, they're looking for a neighborhood where people aren't paying attention and, and those kinds of things. So while I would agree with what Jim said, um, not to be confronting them or confrontational with them, I, I would definitely make myself um, um, seen is, is mm -hmm. I guess, the easiest way to do it. You wanna occupy the public spaces. So when you're outside working on your yard and, and doing those kinds of things and getting your neighbors to do those same, same things, it's harder for them to do their business because they're trying sure. to move into a neighborhood where people are hiding in their houses and doing those kinds of things. So if you're out, mm -hmm. out and about doing things and waving to them and saying, hi, how you doing? And maybe even, you know, mm, I see what you're doing or something without being confrontational, those things alone might convince them that they really need to find some place um, less hospitable to, to carry out their business. And I guess just to add a point to that is that I've seen that happen with the neighborhoods where, you know, when neighbor, neighbors band together, I mean, they're a very powerful source mm -hmm. to deal with any situation. And, and we've seen that within our community where, you know, like the chief says is that you don't stay within your house, as you, within your house, you get outside and interact with your neighbors. That's a good thing, you know, take back your neighborhood. And uh, yeah, you're right. Confronting them and saying, you know, we don't condone that activity really goes a long way. Okay. At what age is usually someone exposed to drugs or drug abuse involved in their drug use? I guess in the sense of it's, that's a very, it's a very good question, but it's a very broad question. Sure. What I mean by that is, is that it depends on your circumstances and your environment. Now, you might be a young child that sees your parents um, being involved in some type of drug activity. Um, I've heard of stories or have been told stories where a, a student goes to school and tells their teacher. Um, so they're being exposed to that at, at a young age. Now, I think students or young adults, um, with, as they grow older, they come across a situation where they have to make the right choice, whether they want to be, you know, partake in that or not. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then, of course, people that are adults. I mean, the same thing is, I don't think there's a particular age in regards to where you you start to be involved in some type of drug situation um, because it's so wide-ranging. I mean, it depends on the circumstances. I mean, typically, you know, from what I've understand in the research is that, I mean, people that have used drugs, you know, in the Midwest is that they there's been an 8.3% increase in uh, substance abuse with children 12 years and older. So that's a mm -hmm. very young age. I would say that's really the, the target age there where <clears throat> you really want to know what's going on with your kids and really have those conversations and understand who their, their friends are. It's really mm -hmm. in that middle school age, it's kind of the key age where um, they're making adjustments. Sure. And, and so you want to teach them how to resist peer pressure and, and make the right decisions. In our schools, how young would you say they're exposed to in our school system right now? Drugs or what they appear in? I mean, is it in elementary school, junior high, high school? Probably middle school, middle school. In, into high school, but the middle school is where um, it, would, it would probably start in most cases. And again, that the things that you would want to do as a parent or an aunt or an uncle or a grandparent or something is, is uh, yeah, I was going to make a comparison, but I'll, mm -hmm. I'll leave it alone. It's, uh, 
don't be afraid to talk about it because right. not talking about it, it's not going to be a secret. They're going to be sure. running into it and dealing with the situation. So you want to talk about it. You want them to be aware of it. And you want to set those expectations with those children so mm -hmm. that they, they understand what your expectations are and how you're against it and, and explain those reasons why. And then really kind of set them up with the tools to be able to resist peer pressure. Um, one of the things that's offered in the county now is a program called Strengthening Families for families that, that have um, some issues with trying to set boundaries mm -hmm. and such with their children. And so we teach some of those skills on, on how to confront and resist peer pressure and really some very simple skills that can be learned. Nice. When somebody's using drugs, um, how does it affect their life? You know, as they get deeper and deeper into it, what are, you know, some of the factors that are affected? Well, I guess the, the first factors that are major factors is that what you see is, you know, someone that starts to become involved in that is, you know, they might lose their job, they lose their marriage, they lose friendships. So, I mean, those are very uh, big events in someone's life as you, uh, as you go along. But, you know, per, as an individual that's involved in uh, narcotic uses, you know, you have to deal with depression because, you know, these things might have occurred to you and now you have to deal with that mm -hmm. situation. Um, obviously, if you're involved in narcotics, you may go to jail. Um, so, I mean, that's a very uh, big possibility. And, you know, the, the things that we see now um, and that we're trying to deal with is, is in regards to heroin use is that we have a number of overdoses and which obviously can lead to death. So some of the, those are some of the things as you become involved in it that are gonna affect your life, obviously. So um, physically, uh, you're, you're gonna start to see signs. If I, if I was a family member and uh, you were involved in some type of uh, drugs, specifically heroin or some other type of um, hard drug, I mean, you're gonna start to see the difference. I mean, a person's gonna start to, you know, their, their attitude is gonna change their physical appearance is gonna change. Um, so there, there's a number of things you're gonna see that affect a person that gets involved in that type of activity. Well, that leads us into the next question is, how can someone tell you know, the signs, early signs, or that you know, they are using? You know? I would just, really an answer to both that question and, yeah. and the prior question, um, especially with juveniles, some of the things that you're gonna look for is really change in behavior. So they're gonna become withdrawn, um, you're going to be able to notice they're hanging out with different friends. Mm -hmm. Really just simple signs like that are, are things that you're looking for. Maybe they're not interested in some of the same things and you don't know what they're doing. Some of that withdrawing and changing friends are two of the big indicators. You know, that's a, that old statement is uh, um, Billy, Billy used to do this and now Billy's not like that anymore. No. You know, that's a, it's a, it's a very true statement. And, you know, the, the state of Wisconsin has a, uh, a heroin initiative going on called uh, theflyeffect.com. Mm -hmm. And one of the testimonials on that website talks about a father who um, ended up, his daughter overdosed, and when the EMTs were on scene and uh, trying to resuscitate his daughter, is the EMTs made a comment when they looked around the room is that there were sporting event trophies and other things. And then the father talks later about that, how his daughter changed. Um, once was very involved and became non-involved. And it, it was very evident um, that something was going on in her life, and in this case, it was drugs. How can one help either a family member or a friend or somebody who they know who's using, and they want to help turn their life around? How can someone help this person? I, I guess the, the first thing is, and the chief mentioned it before, is that it's almost to the point of like, how can someone, it's before someone can help. It's that you have to talk about things. Sure. Okay, you have to talk about things that um, might not be, might make you uncomfortable, um, such as, you know, drug use and abuse. Um, talk with your, uh, your uh, children about that. So uh, when, as you talk about that, that hopefully will prevent that from occurring. Mm -hmm. But if you do observe that, you know, you have to confront that issue. You can't say I'm gonna deal with that later or it's gonna go away. You have to have early proactive involvement in the situation. Um, be persistent with the person that's involved that, that they might not acknowledge that problem initially, but be persistent saying, I think that you've changed, I think that you have an issue, and get them on board with you in regards to that, we can do this together, we can find you mm -hmm. assistance. 
So, and, and within our community, we have a number of resources. Um, that's through the uh, um, uh, social services and through our professional he health care providers in the area that they can uh, provide treatment or counseling. Um, so, I mean, you have to start to look, out, look for those resources and use them. I guess the first starting point also would be is that person has to admit they have a problem. Yes. You know, that's the first big step in that communication like you were talking about, but then to get them to admit they do have an issue or a problem with it. You know, so, okay. Um, moving on. I just need to get my question up here. What are some of the programs um, that the uh, Sheboygan Police Department is instituting as far as, you know, education about, you know, drug abuse, drug use, um, working with the neighborhoods and such? Yeah, I think there's a lot of different programs and resources that we have. The number one thing is what you, what you mentioned, our neighborhood um, initiative. So we have officers assigned to every neighborhood, um, encourage neighborhood meetings, are willing to show up and talk about different topics. We have the Sheboygan County MEG unit, who's also um, a resource to show up someplace and provide a presentation and share information. Mm -hmm. um, right now, because of the issue that we're having with heroin in the, the city and the county, and again, the state and all across the country, we've started a heroin initiative that we're working with all kinds of partners throughout the community. Um, Jim can talk about that a little bit, but they're putting together all kinds of resources. One of the places that wasn't mentioned to the last um, question, um, if somebody's trying to confront the problem and is really looking for somebody as a resource, um, if you have health insurance, obviously you can go through your, mm -hmm. your, your health insurance provider and your doctor to, to try to find resources. But if you really don't know where to turn for some of these resources, Mental Health America is one of the resources that, that we would offer up. Um, phone number is 920-458-3951. And their website is www.mhassheboygan.org. Um, and they can um, ask you essentially a series of questions to find out mm -hmm. how best to direct you to what resources might be available to you. So that would be a good place. And I guess I'm glad the chief brought that up because that was kind of what I was going to get to in regards to the, one of the major persons to call our organizations is that Mental Health America to get you, on, to get you going in regards to finding the help that you're looking for. Now, they're a resource in regards to finding that help. Um, some other things I just wanted to mention was is that, you know, they are not 24-7, but uh, you can also call the Sheboygan County Mental Health Crisis Line at uh, 459-3151. And also there's a uh, great website called uh, under SAMHSA, which is S-A-M-H-S-A. And their website is called find, findtreatment.samhsa, S-A-M-H-S-A dot gov. That has a lot of information about not only um, addiction problems, I mean mm -hmm. actually drug addiction problems, but also alcohol and other issues. So those are some good resources. But what I really wanted to talk about too was is a while back, uh, we ended up um, applying for a grant through the City of Sheboygan Police Department in regards to a heroin initiative. Um, we did receive that grant, and then on top of that, the Acuity Foundation donated $100,000 towards the oh. efforts. Um, that allowed us to expand our scope of what we would like to do outside the city of Sheboygan. And so what we ended up doing, it, doing was is that we got a number of um, service providers, and what I mean by that is that we got healthcare professionals, social services, law enforcement, and nonprofits and other agencies involved together at the table to talk about how can we deal with this problem together. And what you'll see now is it's, it's titled Sheboygan County Service Providers. And what we've been doing, we've been meeting to uh, find means to how can we uh, address this issue within Sheboygan County. Now, one of the main objectives is education because mm -hmm. uh, what we want to do is we want to go into the schools and educate the, the teachers, the students, their parents. Um, the other one is, is that uh, We'd like to find, we'd like to provide provide educational talks to members of our community outside the schools, sure. and we're going to be putting that on our website where you would call, contact the Family Resource Center, and I can provide you that number uh, in the near future. But to call them and schedule that appointment uh, to have an educational talk for whatever whatever type mm -hmm. of organization you'd like, 
Um, so we have a number of things that we're trying to do within the community, and we're moving forward with a number of those objectives. That sounds like an excellent plan as, you know, I, like I said, I saw the presentation that you put on through the Citizens Academy mm -hmm. in that short segment, and that was very informational. I thought you guys did a great job on that as far as that goes. Um, so we have the education where that'll be coming out where people can go for education. Any other advice that you may have, you know, as far as drug use or somebody you know is using drugs, you know, any other advice that you may have? Specific advice that way, I would say no, but I would say, you know, what mm -hmm. it's called quality of life, and so what yep. we're really talking about is is recognizing um, how drugs impact the community and the quality of life in the community, and I think it's done on many different levels. It can be uh, on the individual and family level where you see um, the abuse of, of alcohol or mm -hmm. legal, non-legal drugs can really break down the family unit and cause all kinds of problems on that level. Um, that same abuse can tear apart neighborhoods, and that's why it's important that neighbors are working together to set those expectations in their neighborhoods. It can really have an economic effect on the, the community um, based on the effects that it can have on the workforce. So mm -hmm. people with, with drug and alcohol problems really don't perform the way that we want them to, to at work, so it, it really disrupts the community that way. So it's something um, that it's important that we understand really happens at all levels. It's just not some stranger in a dark alley sure. that's, that's really doing this. It's happening all around us and it's affecting everybody in the community. So it really takes a community-wide effort to, to address it. I, I guess the point, oh, I'm sorry, Chief. No, go ahead. I guess the point, oh, uh, in October we had a National Drug Drop-Off Day. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things, the, we got the information out to the community, um, not only us, the whole community was involved in that. And we had a record number of prescription drugs dropped off. So that's just one thing that the community can do that's very simple to, to avoid issues that are associated with that. I mean, use those facilities to get rid of those unwanted or unneeded medications. Um, the other thing is take advantage if you see something where there's an opportunity to attend one of those educational talks. Take advantage of that. Bring a friend, bring your, uh, your children mm -hmm. to listen uh, to uh, this issue and then discuss it on your way home. Um, so I guess, you know, take advantage of things where you can learn or do something that you might not think impacts the community, but it does. So I guess, you know, I would like to see that. And I think a lot of people, I mean, that showed during that drug yeah. drop off. People took advantage of that. That's excellent. And I, yeah, I would just say too, I think Jim makes the, the, the really the most excellent point about doing something as simple as checking your house for those drugs and getting them out of there. So focusing on prevention is, is really the key to this, mm -hmm. not just um, reactionary things like enforcement after. Yes, we have, we have a responsibility to, to uphold the laws and, and do enforcement action, but we can't be working downriver all the time. We gotta try to get ahead of it and, and work on some of that prevention, some of those things upriver that are gonna prevent sure. the problem down the line. So I think it's important that we as a community recognize that a lot of our work really needs to be upriver and not just reactive things downstream. Okay. I'd like to thank you both for appearing on the show. I mean, I'd love to continue talking about it, but our time is up. So I'd like to thank you, Chief Don Magalski and Captain Wieser for appearing on the show and educating us on you know, how drugs can affect our quality of life. Uh, thank you for watching. I'm Dave Augustine, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.